Sisters, I'm so happy to be with you today. I'm Marilyn Faulkner. I serve up in the Julian branch, and I spent 16 wonderful years in the Poway Stake with my family many years ago when our children were small. And that memory of the Poway Stake is bookended by ministering that was done to me. And so I feel very honored to spend just a few minutes talking to you about ministering. Now, I was all dressed up last night, had my makeup on, I'd even got my hair done yesterday, so I was going to impress you with my good looks, but I couldn't think of what to say, even though I had written my talk. And this morning I woke up early and thought maybe it would be more appropriate to just stay in my jammies and talk to you the way we've mostly been over the last year. I got a text from a friend the other day, another Relief Society president, who said, 5.30 p.m., too early for jammies? Uh, I'm just asking for a friend. And that's kind of how we've all felt. We've lived in our jammies. I just have a few minutes to talk to you as we open this ministering conference. And uh, when Jan and I, uh, she's been a friend for many, many years, and I honor her. I think she's one of the most wonderful ladies I know. Uh, when she called and asked me to give this talk, we were talking about the things that had come into our hearts about ministering. And this is the thing that had come into her heart. And uh, I want to share her vision with you as we begin this conference. Open your scriptures with me if you'd like to, to Mark 2. As you know, Mark is the oldest gospel. He tells the stories of Jesus first. And Matthew and Luke then take about 90% of those stories and elaborate on them in different ways. Mark places Jesus in his own home in Mark 2. And Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, and it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered as there was no room, not even in front of the door, and he taught them the word. And some came bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. When they could not get near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was and dug through it and let down the bed on which the paralyzed man lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now the story goes on, but there's so many important things in those, just those first few verses. First of all, Jesus was at home, and so are most of us most of the time. And many of the things that we will talk about in this conference are about how to minister when you can't do the same things that you used to be able to do. It may be that you have experienced quarantine or a COVID-type situation in your own life for many years because you may be restricted either by small children or by an infirmity according to your health or by shyness or by depression. Something has kept you from being able to minister in a way that you imagine that ministering ought to be done. So let's blow the roof off that right now and talk about three things about ministering that I think are more important than uh, adhering to some preconceived notion of what you think it needs to be like. First of all, to whom should we minister? Um, I have a little phrase that I've used in my mind for a few years now, which I call moral proximity. Maybe a, an easier way to say that would be something I heard on a beautiful movie I watched last night with Craig called Land, which I recommend to you, which is a movie about ministering. Beautifully done. Um, and as the gentleman who saves the life of a woman he finds says, you were in my path. I basically just stumbled over you. Well, I've had the question for many years, you know, who is my neighbor? To whom should I minister? As I drive into a parking lot, if there's someone begging with a sign, am I supposed to stop every time, every day, and meet that person? Who is the person to whom I should minister? Well, there's one easy answer, and that is in the church, we are given names of people to whom we should minister. They are in our path, given to us by the Lord. Now, many times, these are people who really don't care if they have any contact with the church, and some of them are even antagonistic toward the church. So I have a little piece of advice about the people in our path, and that is, first of all, Let's be completely honest. If someone is placed in your path and assigned to you to minister and you're not quite sure if that person wants to see you, have that conversation. We do not have to try to manipulate people into joining the church, coming back to church, being active in the church. 
None of those things are part of our responsibility. Our responsibility is to simply bring the Spirit of the Lord and His healing grace and His physical help into any situation where we are called. So it's you can simply call or speak to that person or text or write an email and say, listen, I've been called to be your minister. Will you guide me on this? I want you to have a positive experience in this ministering situation, and I want to have one too. We used to have an argument as missionaries in Japan when we were on our mission. What was the best door approach? What was the best way to get people to talk to us? What was the best way to get someone to open the door? There was a little elder named Ishigashi Choro who put up with him about as long as he could. And one day he said, don't you understand? It doesn't matter what you say. We were all shocked. We spent all of our time thinking about this. And Ishiguro Choro said, Ishiguro Choro said, I was standing in a bookstore. I was a high school student. There were these two guys in suits. All I knew is I wanted to be next to them. I don't remember what they said to me. So that leads us to our next stage of ministering. First of all, let's be perfectly honest and not have an, an agenda. Let's establish with the person the parameters for how much they'd like to have contact with us and have no contact if that's what they say. Okay, second, I feel like ministering is a group effort. And that is, if you're called to minister to someone, you're not the only one who's ever been called and you're not the only one that will ever be called. And that to me answers the question of what do I do about the beggar on the street? I ask the Lord to bless me and show me who is in my path. Um, one day you may be asked to stop. One day you may not. There isn't an overriding policy on this. We need to follow Jesus' example. He walked into crowds and he ministered to one or two people, leaving hundreds to wonder, why not me? It's because he was following his father's guidance, who was in his path. The story of the Good Samaritan is a perfect example of asking the Lord, who is in my path? And when someone seems to be in my path, asking the Lord, what shall I do? By the way, the person in the story of the Good Samaritan didn't do everything that needed to be done. At some point, he paid somebody else to do some stuff. In other words, you aren't alone. There will be people to help you. Now, so it doesn't really matter what you say. When you go into a situation of ministering, what matters is what you hear and see and do. Do not feel that you need to explain to that person why whatever happened to them happened to them, because odds are none of us know. But we do know that God loves them. We do know angels are near. And we do know that Jesus wants to come in that door with you if you can get that door to open to you. I had an experience very, very early on when we lived in Poway where a lady who had three small children, I had three small children, I didn't know her. I'm not, I think she was a member of the church. I don't remember if her husband was, but he was killed in an accident. He was on the border patrol and he was killed in, in a tragic random accident, leaving her devastated. It was very easy to make the meal. Very easy to get the ham and funeral potatoes together. Very easy to drive over there, and I couldn't get out of the car. I sat in the car, just terrified to go to the door. What would I say? What could I say? And besides that, I was afraid. So I had three little children, and she was going through the thing I feared most. To make a long story short, I finally somehow other managed to stumble up to the door and not doorbell ditch the food. When that door opened, I felt... <clears throat> almost a rush, like a change in air pressure when she opened that door. The Spirit of the Lord was so strong in that home. There were people there who loved her. There was comfort. There was joy. She opened the door and brought me into her arms and brought me into that home. I learned a lesson I will never forget. Jesus is there before you. All you need to do is mention it, that you feel him there and that you know he's there. Say his name. Bring his power. I want to conclude by asking you to go through the temple in your mind. It's been a while since we got to go through the temple, many of us. My brother works in the temple right now. And when someone goes through the temple, at least in their temple, he is assigned to take that one person from the beginning in the beautiful initiatory ordinances all the way to the end through the veil. 
he and one person together. And as he does that, he, as he did that one day, he called me and he said, Marilyn, I've never thought about the temple in that way. And as we talked about it, we remembered that it begins and ends with blessing, that we are blessed up one side and down the other, that we're blessed physically with health and strength, that we're blessed spiritually with power, that the priesthood and our covenants and the actual literal power of the atonement of Christ will come in and save us, that we will feel that the things in our lives have meaning, that the things in our lives that happen to us are part of a larger plan. As you think about ministering during this conference and about maybe blowing the roof off the way your ministering has been done in the past, can you think about your temple covenants and what they mean in your life? Those covenants give you power. You never walk into a situation alone. Angels are with you. The power of the priesthood is with you. The power of your covenants is with you. And Jesus himself chooses you as his emissary to go and help people feel what he felt. The source of Jesus' power, we learn in the temple through our own physical experience that the source of his power is his wounds. His power comes from what he has suffered. Most of us by this time in our lives have a little bit of a flap in the eye, a few wrinkles. We're a little bit beat up by life. That is the source of our power because what life has brought us has been given meaning through our testimony of Jesus and through our covenant relationship with him that exists because we are members of this beautiful church. I pray a blessing of the Lord on you that as you minister in small ways and large, that you will feel the power of Christ with you, the power of your covenants with you, and that what you say and do will be in even a small part what he says and does when he ministers. And that in the end, you won't beat yourself up because you didn't get to everyone, because you didn't stop at every situation, because you didn't say the perfect thing or do the perfect thing, because you're not alone when you minister. You're only one of a host of angels and other people who are attending that person through their life because of the love God has for them. And for you to get to feel just a portion of that love and share it with others is one of the greatest blessings the church brings us as ministers and as those who are ministered to. And as one who's been served by the members of the Poway Stake for much of my adult life, I thank my Heavenly Father for people like you and pray that the Lord would bless you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.